Persona 3, Fez, Portable, and its theatrical adaptations are far from perfect pieces of media. The narrative's pacing isn't all that great, some of the social links aren't very good, and we just pretend that some of them don't even exist, a couple of the vocal performances are pretty weak, and the answer is unnecessarily grindy for no real reason other than it looks pretty impressive when you say 30 hours of extra content in pre-release material. And yet, in spite of these very valid criticisms, this collection of releases ended up becoming my favorite series of all time. So what exactly is it that I love about this game? Well, that's what we're here to discuss, because as opposed to my standard good, bad, and conclusion segments, I just want to gush about everything that makes me love Persona 3 and its related media so damn much. Think of it like a slightly more professional version of your friend ranting about something they love for hours on end, and you're just sitting there like, yep, mm-hmm, I completely understand. A few things before we get started though. I'll be frequently mixing in elements I like about the films, mangas, drama CDs, stage plays, that one phone game that's essentially lost media at this point, and plenty of other official sources alongside the games themselves. Like when I discuss game Makoto, I'll also be mixing in elements I like about movie Makoto's characterization, or Katone. The weird masquerade stage play and her manga appearances expand on parts of her character rarely touched on in her actual games, so I'll be taking those into account as well. Some of you may not agree with this approach, but I personally don't like to completely separate adaptations like this is the game and this is the movie and nothing in them can have any overlap. I like to pick and choose elements I love from every different version and kind of smash them all together to create an even stronger version of the thing I like. Is that technically cheating? Absolutely. Am I gonna stop doing it? Nope. Oh, another heads up. I'm going to get all sorts of sappy as the video goes on. So if that kind of flowery stuff annoys you, well, again, I'm not going to stop, but there's your warning. And one last thing. There will be massive spoilers for not only Persona 3, but 4 and 5 as well. You may be asking, why? Well, some segments just worked better when I brought in similar elements from other releases to compare and contrast. So if you care at all about spoilers, here's your warning. Without further ado, Let's start our journey. There's so much to discuss here, but I'm mainly focusing on what specific elements really resonated with me personally. So if I missed something that you thought was great, that's why. It's also completely possible that I just forgot. That happens a lot. Persona 3 features two main gameplay portions. The first, a year-long journey to the top of a massive tower called Tartarus with turn-based combat. The second, a social sim where you strengthen the bonds you have with those around you to enhance your ability to create more powerful personas for the combat sections. Let's start with the combat. The dungeon crawling of Tartarus is the part that's received the most flack over the years, and while I share some of the critiques, I found this game's combat very unique compared to the rest of the series. Even though Persona 5's is significantly easier, I still prefer that game's because everything just feels so damn fluid. But in Persona 3, I like that there's a bit more to take into consideration when planning your trips through the tower. You have to check on the physical condition of your teammates to make sure they're going to be able to fight effectively that night, you can't directly control them in Vanilla or Fez, and you can't fight too long without risking exhaustion or sickness. The lack of direct commands isn't an awful idea in theory, and is actually super neat from a thematic standpoint, but the AI just wasn't good enough at the time for something like this. It was much better than I thought it would be though. Stuff like this can be a bit overwhelming at first compared to the simplicity of 5 and especially 4, but there's something satisfying about that feeling of being a team leader that needs to rely on others instead of soloing everything like Narukami or walking Phoenix's Joker. Despite that though, I'm still going to use a direct combat mod for this video, because I've already played through this game 3 times and I really don't feel like having battle footage messed up because the AI thought it would be a great idea to use a medicine item instead of Meteorahan. Like, thanks Yukari, but what about the other 300 health that I'm missing? Another thing that's unique compared to its follow-ups is that there's multiple different types of physical strikes and associated weapons compared to future entries. Melee weapon users that can deal strike or slash damage, such as Akihiko and Mitsuru, are more accurate, but they're more liable to trip up if they miss an attack especially if they're not in good condition or greater. Then there's Pierce. Yukari specializes in Pierce attacks with her practice bow. Since she fires from range, she's more likely to miss, but she can't be tripped up by a miss, even if she's completely exhausted. As for the social simulator aspect, this serves as a nice way to break up the Tartarus explorations. 
throughout the school year, you can meet all sorts of characters around town and start their social links, which, for the uninitiated, are basically self-contained mini-narratives focusing around that character's struggles and how the protagonist helps them throughout. Progressing through their stories not only allows you to learn more about them, but it gives you massive experience bonuses when fusing personas of that Link's arcana, and once you've maxed them out, you gain access to that arcana's ultimate persona. Unlike most of 4's and all of 5's, picking a really dickish or in poor taste option can flat out break the Link and force you to spend time mending it. Almost like a real friendship with real people. Wow. And like real people, your teammates all have lives outside of yours. Like some days, Yukari won't be available for Tartarus exploration because she's studying all night for a big test the next day. And last but certainly not least, it would be absolutely criminal for me to not at least give a passing nod to the soundtrack. Across the three games and four films, it pivots in so many different directions. There's your standard catchy overworld tracks, some incredible boss themes, beautiful goodbye pieces that make you feel empty inside, the one bad song in the entire soundtrack, and of course, the absolute banger raps by Lotus Juice that you wouldn't think would fit this kind of story. So while I do enjoy Persona 3 as a game, as I said at the top, the characters and their journeys are what I really want to fixate on with this video. And what better place to start than with the protagonists themselves. Across Persona 3, there's two separate protagonists you can play as, both with completely different social links and personalities. Makoto Yuki in Persona 3 and Fez, and Katoni Shiomi in Persona 3 Portable. I know there's many names that have been used for these characters across their various appearances since their creation, but I'm going to be using the quote-unquote canon ones for this video. Both of these characters share the same backstory and general role in the game's narrative, both of them watched their parents die in a car crash a decade ago, leaving them orphaned and emotionally maladjusted in their own ways. They both then spend the next decade bouncing between relatives and various foster homes, trying to just take everything one day at a time, until accidentally stumbling upon an ongoing war kept from the public eye, a conflict between a small group known as Seas and monstrous demon-like shadows. Even from minute one of stumbling upon this hidden war, it's shown that there's something off about them compared to other participants. Both of them are able to casually walk the dark hour, a supernatural phenomenon that causes a 25th hour to occur every night at midnight with seeming impunity. What's seen as a living nightmare for those unlucky enough to be caught in it is nothing more than a simple night out for them. Additionally, during their sudden awakening on the dorm's roof, they not only awaken to their own persona, but another savage entity that takes the form of the Greek personification of death itself, Thanatos, which ultimately tears apart the magician's shadow with ease. Throughout the following treks through the Dark Hour and Tartarus, they're shown to be unnaturally gifted persona wielders, not only holding the power to wield multiple personas, also known as a wild card, but they're the only traditional wild cards in the entire series capable of utilizing fusion spells. By combining the powers of two specific personas, they're able to cast an incredibly powerful version of said spell that can completely alter the course of battle if used at the right moment. While it's really easy to say that they're the only characters that can use them because Atlas realized some of these spells were wildly overpowered and decided to axe them in future entries, it's important to note that when Aegis gains the same wildcard power in the answer, she isn't able to utilize them. This one little detail gives a lot of credence to the idea that these protagonists were only able to utilize this power through their special relationship with death. So, with the commonalities covered, let's get into what makes them so different from one another. Representing the number zero in the tarot card deck is Makoto Yuki. In the games, Makoto's personality is largely player determined. You can be a nice guy TM, or a complete dickhead, but no matter which side you pick, he ultimately comes across as a bit flat. But you can see the potential in him. This is where the movies come in, and they're the reason why I love this character so much. When adapting Persona 3 for the big screen, the writers took some of his more apathetic traits and really ran with them. Here, Makoto's apathy isn't limited to the occasional I don't care dialogue option, it extends to every aspect of his life, including his numerous close encounters with death, which is wonderfully illustrated by how he reacts to the danger presented by the magician shadow in the opening act of Spring of Birth. Yukari warns them that if they don't hurry, they could both die, to which he coldly responds, 
死ぬってそんなに怖いこと An important distinction here, while it may seem at first that it's being presented in a too cool for you edgelord kind of way, we quickly come to find out that it's actually the pure indifference of a broken soul. Makoto genuinely doesn't understand why one would fear death, because all of our lives will eventually come to an end someday. So, to him, why should he bother caring about what happens on the journey if its ending is already set in stone? His apathy is so extreme that even though he's well aware that something isn't right with him, he doesn't have the motivation to do anything about it one way or another. He doesn't see a point in trying to fix it through therapy or, even on a more extreme end, ending his pain by killing himself. He just goes where people lead him and waits for the day's end so that he can start it all over again. Until that inevitable day where it just doesn't happen and everything fades. Through his chance meeting with Seize, though, he slowly starts to open up a bit, rediscovering what it means to live. All of his cohorts try to reach him, especially Junpei, but it's only through Fuka's completely earnest desire to reconcile with her friend Natsuki, despite the latter's constant attempts to push her away, does Makoto begin to soften. Seeing somebody just as lonely as him find real friendship, despite everything going against her, He can't help but crack a genuine smile, likely for the first time in years. So, even if it's not much, the idea has been planted in his subconscious that maybe I don't have to live like this. Maybe I can have that too. As the year goes on, he continues to open up bit by bit, and that apathetic shell really begins to crack. But he still struggles with understanding the long term purpose for his existence. Once Seize nears the end of their mission to take down the Twelve Arcana Shadows, he contemplates if he really even wants the Dark Hour to disappear. After all, fighting shadows with his friends is the first time he's felt like his life has purpose. When the Dark Hour comes, he's a hero capable of taking on the entire world. But without that, he fears that he'll go back to being nothing, and his friends will abandon him because of it. And the deaths of Shinjiro and Takaharu push him even further into abandoning everything. Seeing the abject anguish their deaths cause those close to him only serves to reaffirm that idea nagging at the back of his mind. The idea that forming bonds is pointless, because in the end, they'll all leave you one way or another. So he's constantly fighting the urge to protect his heart from loss by telling himself if you don't let yourself get close to somebody, it won't hurt when they inevitably leave you behind. But eventually, that very idea gets flipped on its head, and Makoto concludes that. That's actually what life is all about. Time may guide us all to the same destination, but maybe the fact that we have such limited time is exactly why it's important to treasure the people close to you. To utilize that precious time to make as many wonderful memories as possible with them and pass on without any lasting regrets. At the other end of the deck, we have number 22, Katone Shiomi. Even though she follows the exact same backstory and retains the persona wielding abilities of her male counterpart, a significantly different approach was taken with her, with the idea of how much would the world around the protagonist change if you flipped everything about them on its head? Of course, there's the more superficial things, such as her general color palette consisting of bright pinks and reds instead of blues, but then you have very important changes, such as her outward personality. Which is the complete opposite of movie Makoto's and much less player determined than his game counterpart. In fact, her dialogue options in Portable are much more akin to Ren's in Persona 5, where despite being an avatar for the player, you can still get a very clear idea of what this person is like. Katone is very energetic, always has a smile on her face, and radiates this intense gremlin energy. Honestly, she's pretty much the textbook definition of disaster by. However, underneath this bubbly exterior, she's just as broken as her male counterpart. She simply deals with her trauma differently. While Makoto is more outwardly apathetic about life and doesn't care whether his actions worry others, Katone hates to be treated differently or see others pity her, so she puts up this face to try and hide with an equally self destructive yet different outlook to Makoto. If you don't acknowledge your pain, you'll never have to come to grip with the fact that you're not okay. And while the stuff we get in game is great, it's a damn shame that she was never able to reach her full potential like Makoto. 
her character was never given the theatrical treatment, and the only time she ever appeared in future titles was in Persona Q2, which did help a bit since it added a new dimension to her character. Just like movie Makoto, she's shown to have a near crippling fear of abandonment. Because of the game's weird plot of pulling her into the quote-unquote canon universe, no one knew who the hell she was. Even the people that make up C's in her timeline didn't know her since she's not supposed to exist in their world. It's a bit of a contrived setup, as with most of the spin-off titles, but the important thing to take from it is that it showed how much it hurt her to be yanked away from a group of people she didn't just get along with because it's easier than making a scene, but one that she genuinely cared about. Another inverse of Makoto is how she responds to those that cause strife for her and her friends. While Makoto is fairly level-headed about it and usually never goes further than getting them out of whatever trouble they're in, because Katona's emotions aren't as repressed as his, she's unusually quick to jump to violence, even if the situation has already been resolved. As shown in Sayori Hasegawa's social link and the drama CDs, she won't hesitate to go after someone that hurts those she's close with. And in these cases, the use of violence is almost never appropriate. In the first drama CD, Kenji makes some admittedly pretty shitty comments about her friend Ryo in a yukata. So even after Yukari shoes him away and the situation is resolved, the rest of her friends can see plain as day that she's still seeing red. She's determined to chase Kenji down and beat the living shit out of him, only to have Yukari and Ryo talk her down from it. Or a more extreme example, towards the very end of the game, when the group finally beats Strega's leader, Takaya. In that moment, he's no longer an active threat and won't be able to interfere with the group's journey. But unlike Makoto, she's given the option to try and kill him anyway out of vengeance. Thankfully, if the player does pick that option, Aegis will step in to stop her from making a very big mistake. All of this feeds more into the very idea behind her character. The idea of the butterfly effect. She's undeniably built off of Makoto's base, but how much could change about that character and the world around them were they to approach things just a bit differently? Both went through horrible things no child should ever have to. Makoto's response was to repress his emotions until he was nothing more than a shell of a person, but Katone instead decided to hide them from the public, wearing a mask of what she thought people would want to see. This approach left her emotions largely intact, but because she wore that mask for so long, she doesn't know how to handle them properly, leading to her flying off the handle when the few people she actually cares for are in trouble. Further strengthening this butterfly effect approach is that the changes don't just stop at personality. Her version of the story also allows for some narrative divergences not present in Makoto's. The main overarching narrative is still the same. Wildcard shows up at the dorm, learns about shadows, nothing actually happens until October, they potentially get into a super questionable relationship with some ethereal being. But since Katone is more socially out there, and has a much more welcoming, if you'll pardon the pun, persona compared to Makoto, it creates a trickle-down effect on the world around her, resulting in quite a few smaller differences within the narrative and character relationships. The biggest example of this is that Shinjiro Aragaki can actually survive the events of the game, albeit in a coma until the very end as to not interfere with the main plot. Initially, this was the one change I really, really didn't like. And to be honest, I'm still not its biggest fan in terms of pure narrative impact. But as a bigger part of what Katone and, to a larger extent, Persona is about, I kinda dig it. Because of that friendly mask that she wears, she was able to get genuinely close to Shinji, and during their conversations, he eventually makes one little offhanded comment about losing his pocket watch. And if she retrieves said watch from Officer Kurosawa, Shinji will carry it on his person for the rest of the game, including his confrontation with Takaya. And by pure dumb luck, it ends up taking just enough of the impact when he gets shot, which allows him to just barely cling to life. Personas 3, 4, and 5 are really heavily focused on just how much life can change due to one single person. 4 and 5 really emphasize this because without Narukami and Ren, the paths taken by the respective friend groups would be entirely different. Katone as a character reflects this idea perfectly. I've always adored alternate takes on a pre-established story, especially when it's one simple change that has a realistic trickle-down effect on the rest of the narrative. Shinjiro's survival and the rest of Katone's route in general 
is exactly that. Proving that when a butterfly flaps her wings, the whole world changes. Having a great main hero is important, but equally important are those that surround them. And there's no shortage of colorful, interesting characters you'll meet on your journey. But there's seven in specific that I feel greatly contribute to the game's larger themes. I'll give a brief overview of each of them. Well, as brief as I can, it's still going to be a long ass segment and how their journeys all tie into the game's main thesis statement. And what better place to start than with our resident goofball turned real prick, then back to lovable goofball, Junpei Iori. At the start of the game, he fills the role of the immature lovable bro character, later filled by Yosuke Hanamura in Persona 4 and Ryuji Sakamoto in Persona 5. I know that's the right way to pronounce his last name, but God damn it, it doesn't sound right. While he's friendly enough during his introduction, throughout the first half of the game, he gets increasingly angry over not being the hero of the group. All the glory goes to their leader because they're the strongest one of them by a long shot. This inferiority complex gets really bad around the Lover's Arcana operation, where he constantly takes passive aggressive pot shots at their leader and generally just gets pissy anytime anyone tries talking to him. When he got this power, he romanticized it in his brain like, Yo, I'm like this rad superhero protecting the people, and I'll lead everyone else to victory with my awesome strength. Only for someone else to come along and be way, way stronger than him. This early game behavior is even worse in Katone's route. From minute one, he's super insecure about being the only guy in the group, and he feels oddly threatened by the fact that their leader is a girl and because of her natural fighting ability, she's in a position of power compared to him. Now, if she breaks down crying in the early train battle, he'll loosen up a bit in the moment and run off to get her a handkerchief to cry into. He's more comfortable with her like this because she's fitting the stereotypical gender role of women being <clears throat> weaker and more emotional, in air quotes. And he's fitting his role as the strong man that takes care of the woman. It's a pretty shitty way of looking at things, I mean, he's like 17 years old, he's a shitty kid, I get it. But it doesn't last forever. As the year marches on, his social link progresses, and they undergo more fights alongside one another, he slowly grows to realize that he shouldn't feel threatened by her being stronger than him, and he eventually apologizes for treating her so shittily earlier in the year, and furthermore, states that her strength no longer intimidates him, but serves as an inspiration for him to become even stronger. Not to rival her, but to be able to fight alongside her as an equal and pick her up when she needs help, just as she has done for him so many times. Going through so much really flipped his viewpoint on the world around him and shaped him into a much more mature man, even though he's still a huge goofball. And in the most surprising display of character growth, he's the only potential romantic option in Portable that will actually turn Katone down. That little disaster by can date boys, girls, and interdimensional beings of both sexes, but not Junpei. He's on that Sigma cry set. <laughs> the Junpei at the start of the game would have happily jumped right into another relationship, but now his heart is still hurting from losing Chidori. And as much as he's grown to treasure Katone's friendship, he just isn't ready for something like that again. Speaking of Chidorita, by the way, She's perhaps an odd choice to talk about so early, but I'm of the mind that you can't really talk about Junpei without bringing her up, and vice versa. They're like a package deal, these two. So let's rewind a bit in the year. First appearing in late June, Chidori serves as by far the most interesting member of Strega, and yet another in the long list of Persona Weird Girls TM. See? Look at him. Initially, her involvement in the story appears to be just that of another flirt target for Junpei. And like most of his flirts, She's not exactly very receptive to him, but he quickly finds himself caring for her on a deeper level when he spots her hands bleeding in public. He tries helping her patch it up, but she doesn't seem to be bothered by it and doesn't get why he is either. Because of the cold, inhumane experiments her and the rest of Strega endured at the hands of the Carijo group, she never really had anything to get attached to, even as a child. This completely stunted her emotional growth to the point where she sees no reason to care about what happens to her and even calls Junpei weird for giving a shit. The films even go as far as to show her intentionally cutting her wrist with a box cutter and letting them bleed for no other reason than why not. Her persona allows her to heal her wounds almost instantly and even if it didn't, it wouldn't bother her one way or another. To her, life is just waking up every day and death is the one time you just 
don't. Eventually, though, her true colors are revealed during a botched kidnapping and she's taken into Kirijo custody. But since Junpei's still deeply concerned about her well-being, he visits her every chance he gets. From bringing her new sketchbooks when she fills one up, to insisting that the rest of C's back off from her, he's constantly doing whatever he can to make her more comfortable. Through these constant visits, that rough shell Chidori has put up since childhood slowly starts to crack. In their own weird little way, the two start to find friends in each other, and eventually, that friendship blossoms into love. Like Aegis falling in love with the protagonists, which we will definitely get to, it's a weird, atypical romance between two very odd people, but it's so goddamn sweet, and more importantly, earnest, that it works. Just as things start looking up though, the rest of Strega comes a-knockin' to play on her fears and pull her back into her old life because they're a bunch of bastards, which leads to her engaging in conflict with Seas at the entrance of Tartarus. And it's here that everything about her is made crystal clear. She's never cared about losing her own life because she didn't have anything meaningful to give it purpose. When she's with Junpei though, she knows true fear, the fear of loss. He's the only one that's ever truly loved her before, and the idea of losing that love terrifies her like nothing else ever has. So rather than face a reality with the inevitability that the one she loves will die someday, she lashes out and tries to push him away to keep her heart safe. It's a much more heightened and obvious version of movie Kodo's whole shtick, which the writers were clearly aware of because when she's laying bare all her fears and insecurity during that fight in the movie, the camera focuses on Makoto, because it's like looking into a mirror for him. Despite her constant attacks, Junpei refuses to fight her and instead gives her the hug and emotional support she so desperately needed for, I don't know, probably 10 years at least. It's only then that they both realize, while they're admittedly complete opposites of each other, they're actually perfect for one another. Chidori's genuine affection for Junpei helped him see both relationships and love in a completely different light. And Junpei showed Chidori that love and the fear of losing said love isn't something to shut out. In fact, that fear of loss actually makes life worth living. Someday, one of them will pass away, yes, but that's what makes the present they have together so precious. So when Takaya shows up to shoot Junpei right in front of her because the universe has a really cruel sense of timing, she makes the decision to save his life at the cost of her own. As established earlier on, her persona allows her to heal wounds and give life to the dead, be it her little houseplant she's constantly reviving, or another human. So knowing that no matter what happens tonight, her time on this earth is very limited, she decides that Junpei could get way more out of life than she ever could. And as she lay dying in his arms, she states that she's delighted to have met him and insists that even though she'll die here, part of her will always live within him, allowing them to always be together as long as he continues to live for the both of them. After the dust settles, Junpei is given her notebook as a memento and is shocked to find that the last drawing she was working on wasn't a weird surreal piece like normal, but a portrait of him. This portrait paints the picture of a man that's loving, caring, and can take on anything that the world would ever throw at him. This further strengthens his resolve to improve himself, to really become that man that Chidori saw him as. And he actually sticks to it. Throughout the rest of the journey, he's far kinder and just a better friend overall. Where he gets the chance to really shine though is in the answer. Here, he's relatively level-headed, understanding of what everyone is going through, and tries his hardest to keep his friend's spirits up when they're feeling down. Even before fighting Aegis and Metis in the Colosseum, he never even so much as raises his voice. He gets it. It's hard for Aegis to be the leader the group needs her to be and make such monumentally important decisions while she's in so much pain, so he respects her wishes even though he knows they do have to fight. Everything he went through with Chidori really did change his outlook on life, and with the limited time she had with him, it allowed her to finally open herself up to the idea of love and truly live. He's not a perfect person now by any means, and he likely never will be. He's still a bit of a tactless weirdo at times. Like, I beg of you, stop calling Metis hot. 
I get that she's not human, but she was literally born less than a month ago. Stop it, it's fucking weird, dude. But what matters is that he really is trying his best to live for both of them and become the man she saw. A kind, gentle, and caring man that always brightens the world of those around him. Next on the docket, Yukari Takaba. Unlike a lot of the cast, which are heightened yet still relatively grounded people, Yukari acts very much like a real human being that's carrying around some past trauma, which means there's days where she's all sunshine and joy, but others where the slightest little thing will set her off. The best example that comes to mind in the base game is when the protagonist tries comforting her on the beaches of Yakushima. Finally discovering the ugly truth behind her father's death after spending so many years overly fixated on it leaves her feeling aimless and vulnerable. So even though none of these dialogue options are bad per se, each one will piss her off and she'll just keep getting progressively angrier and angrier until she takes a moment to clear her head, realizes that she's acting pretty shitty, and apologizes. Moments like this have led to a lot of, man, Yukari fucking sucks, threads on the worst websites on the internet, but I've never had a problem with them. Like I said, she acts very much like a real person going through some shit, and when you're carrying around heavy personal baggage, you don't always think rationally. You're more prone to lashing out for no reason, even towards people you love, and when you do, it makes you feel like shit once you calm down. Another example that perfectly exemplifies what I'm talking about is during her social link with Makoto. She nearly gets mugged and Makoto comes to her aid, but because she's so insistent on standing on her own two feet, she gets angry at him and storms off. The next time the two hang out, she apologizes and clearly explains her viewpoint. Again, this is just how people work in the real world. As her social link progresses, she starts to let her guard down a bit, takes the steps to repair her relationship with her mother, and learns to open herself up to people again to the point where she ends up falling in love with Makoto. She's still a bit guarded in general, as one would be after going through so much, but she feels like she finally found someone that she can just be her true self around. Things are still far from perfect for her, but they're finally starting to look up a bit, and really, that's enough to motivate her to keep her chin up. And this is just base game Yukari, by the way. Every title after Vanilla P3 improves on her even more. Fez, the Q games, and P3's dancing game that exists for some reason, lightened her up a bit by expanding on her secretive dorky side. The original game gives her a couple fun little quirks, like how easily spooked she gets at every little sound whenever the group has to sneak into the school late at night. But every subsequent appearance of this character built on this more lighthearted side. Her room recording in Fez shows how disappointed she was about not getting to dress up and act like a maid for the school festival. Later on in PQ, Igis accidentally reveals that, judging by the contents on her laptop's hard drive, Yukari is an avid reader of fanfiction. And lastly, Persona 4 Arena literally has her become a star in this universe's version of Power Rangers. And as for her more vulnerable human side, I'll argue that Fez's epilogue, The Answer, greatly improved on her, to the point where she went from being a pretty damn good character to one of my favorites in the entire series. See? There she is, right there. But one example that I feel doesn't get enough attention comes from the fourth movie. As the arrival of Nyx and the seemingly inevitable destruction of the human race draws closer and closer, she completely shuts down. She spends almost every moment locked away in her room and doesn't even bother eating or drinking. This apathy leads her to losing control of her own persona. Now, personas are frequently referred to as the strength of heart, so when her heart yearns for nothing more than for everything to just stop, it leads to that manifestation of her heart turning on her and attempting to strangle her, thus, in its own twisted way, fulfilling her desire to escape from her hopeless situation. Whether this actually happened or not, or it was just a hallucination brought on by severe malnutrition and dehydration, is left up in the air. But either way, that level of apathy towards one's own fate when they've been told when their clock is going to tick down is frighteningly real. This is why I think Yukari stands out so much amongst the Persona 3 cast. Makoto, Junpei, Aegis, they're all great, but everything surrounding Yukari just has a very real energy that I absolutely love. With the context of all these future sequels and spin-offs, Yukari goes from being an interesting, solid character in her own right to a near-perfect mix of lighthearted fun and real, relatable humanity. Moving on, we have Mitsuru Kirijo. 
One of Caesar's founding fathers, so to speak, and the token rich girl, her standoffish nature initially makes her seem like the snobby rich girl that's too good to be involved with anyone else. But it's gradually shown that her nature isn't malicious in the slightest, it's all in her upbringing. Because she was born to one of the richest, most powerful families in Japan, she can more than handle herself in a professional environment, such as student council or the regular C's team meetings. Take her out of that environment though, and you see firsthand that she was incredibly sheltered from the real world, and it led to her being so socially maladjusted that it borders on comical. Scratch that, it doesn't border on comical, it is comical. Like when the protagonist takes her out to eat at a local fast food joint, and she has to ask them, Okay, how do I even eat a hamburger? It's especially ridiculous in her room recording in Fez. Whoops, I've gotten used to walking around without my bathrobe lately. Not a very good habit to fall into. I genuinely cannot tell if this is her in-character social ineptitude, or just really, really awkward writing. Maybe a bit of both? Both sounds about right. What's also made apparent is that she's not really her own person. She just lets others decide her path for her because that's what she believes she has to do. Her social link showcases her frustrations towards just about every aspect of her life being seemingly out of her control. She feels forced to stay with her current fiance she doesn't love just because it would benefit the Carijo group from a political standpoint. She feels like she was robbed of a normal childhood and thrust into a life she can't handle. And even something simple, like choosing her own clothing, isn't entirely up to her. She's incredibly ignorant to fashion, but even if she were to find something she liked, it would have to be okayed by members of the group to keep their public image up. The last time she really decided her own path was back when she was a little girl. To protect her father from shadows during an inspection of the newly discovered Tartarus, she awakens her own persona, much to the chagrin of her father, who deep down wanted nothing more for her than to escape the Carijo's tainted legacy and forge her own path. You know, I want to linger on this for just a second. While this act is initially seen as an inspiring display of selflessness, because her awakening was literally the first time any of the Carijo scientists had ever seen a persona, it resulted in her being subject to numerous experiments as they tried to figure out what exactly causes a persona awakening in the first place. So on top of her sheltered upbringing, she was also a bit of a guinea pig for a bunch of weirdo scientists, which led to her developing a near debilitating fear of doctors, as briefly shown in Persona Q, where she completely loses her composure at the sight of the kind doctor and its assistants. To be fair though, I think anyone would have lost their shit at this. Okay, back to the main game. With Akutsuki's betrayal and the death of her father later on in the year, there's no one to really turn to to help steer her in the right direction. She's thrust into a classic sink or swim scenario, and despite some initial feelings of aimlessness and self-pity, Yukari is there to comfort her and literally smack some sense into her. You keep that pimp pan strong, girl. Through her time spent with her friends, and especially the protagonist, she comes to accept that she may have been robbed of a normal childhood, and much of her life has been directed by others up until this point, but the future doesn't have to be that way. She then manages to step up and really become the leader her friends need her to be. Even by the end, she's still a bit of a weird girl, but she stands strong as her own person now. This continues into future titles as well. When we catch back up with her in Persona 4 Arena, she's actively making her own decisions, steering the Carijo group into a brighter future with her confident leadership. And hey, would you look at that? She finally got to choose her own wardrobe. Oh my god. Now we come to what is easily my favorite character in the entire franchise, Aegis. A combat android created by the Kirijo group to fight shadows in 1999, or 1998 depending on whether you consider Aegis the first mission to be canon or not, she joins the story around the start of Act 2, and despite seeming like nothing more than an excuse to have awkward fish out of water comedy bits, she ends up really coming into her own, especially when she takes center stage in the answer. When she first joins the team, she's incredibly awkward and ignorant to much of what makes humans, well, human. Everything except her inexplicably strong attachment to the protagonist, which even she admits she doesn't know the reason for, is dictated by logic and objectivity. To her, something like watching over them as they sleep is just the logical thing to do. They're incredibly important to her, and she doesn't have to sleep, so it only makes sense for her to watch over them when they're in that vulnerable state. But to flesh and blood humans, that's a bit creepy. So when Yukari tells her to just let them sleep because watching over them 24-7 is weird, it confuses her. 
There's plenty of fun little moments like this sprinkled throughout the year, especially in the movies where they really play up the unintentionally creepy stalker angle. Like how during the group's Kyoto field trip, she scales the side of the building just to get into Makoto's room. Or how she frequently stands just out of sight staring at people, completely unaware that she looks like something right out of the fucking strangers. While these moments are certainly a good bit of fun, most of them also serve a purpose. With many of them, Igis learns a wee bit more about humans and what makes them act the way they do. And towards the end of the year, after a trip to the Carijo Labs for repairs, she begins to develop human emotions of her own. From happiness, to sadness, to fear, and most importantly, love. Which results in her shedding her first tear for the protagonist during the final battle with Nyx. Now this is the bit that I really want to focus on, the special relationship she has with the protagonist. I'm a bit sappy if you couldn't tell. What do you want from me? What's interesting about this quote unquote love story that can technically be interpreted as platonic, but yeah, okay buddy, is that it doesn't really start out as one. As much as their encounter in Yakushima is referred to as a fateful meeting in retrospect by fans and those involved with the project alike, Aegis's attachment to Makoto or Katone isn't actually born out of love. Due to her memory being wiped in 99, she doesn't even know why exactly she feels such a strong need to be by their side. But even if it's not born out of love, the earnestness of her affection is why she's able to get so close to the protagonists, especially in the film adaptations, where she inadvertently helps bring Makoto back from the brink. After Shinjiro's death, he's fully committed to Pharos's idea of, if you don't let them get close, you'll never have to experience the pain that comes from them leaving you. So, he leaves the dorm and just starts walking. Aegis, obviously confused as to why he's leaving, follows him, despite her heavily damaged state. She tries to insist that it doesn't matter where he's going, she can come with him to stay by his side. But he digs his heels in and insists that it doesn't matter if she cares for him now. One day, she'll vanish from his life just like Shinjiro and everyone else he ever cared about. This sparks a revelation in Aegis. She's been acutely aware of the fact that due to her robotic form, she's been given an unlimited amount of time on this earth, but has struggled with the simple question of why. Seeing Makoto's distress, she feels that she has her answer. Maybe her purpose is just to make sure that this person she cares so much for doesn't have to go through life alone. With this revelation, she promises him that she will never vanish from his life. She will always be there to care for him, and that reassurance is what causes him to stay, solidifying their relationship as something truly special. And just as she pulled him back in his time of need, Makoto is there for her later on when she's at her lowest point and seconds away from killing herself? Jesus Christ! It's just as Aegis posits at the end of the journey. You don't need to save the world to find purpose in life. Sometimes, you just need something simple. Like, someone to take care of. Later on in the story, it's revealed that her initial attachment to Seize's leader was because she sealed the Harbinger of Death within them a decade ago as a last ditch effort to stop it. And even though she couldn't remember, something deep in her subconscious still told her that it was imperative to her mission to stay close to them. It's after this revelation that her emotions really start to change. Her original programming tells her that since death is no longer with them, they're no longer relevant to her mission, meaning that logically, there should be no reason to stay with them. But her heart tells her something different. They're more than just a person of interest now. They're someone she's grown to care for. So what keeps her beside them at this point is a previously foreign emotion to her, guilt. She realizes now that because of her actions on the bridge, she had orphaned someone she cares deeply for, broke their spirit, and cursed them to a life of housing death. But as her guilt awakens new emotions, and she spends more time alongside the protagonist in an attempt to understand what she feels, she ultimately comes to the conclusion that what she now feels is love. Along with that also comes dejection. To Igis, relationships are very narrowly defined by societal norms girl and boy. That's it. But since she still only views herself as a machine and not a girl, she feels like it wouldn't be right for her to be with the protagonist. It's especially hard for her in Katone's case, because since Katone's a girl, she's supposed to, and I quote, find happiness with a man. At least that's what Igis believes, which kinda makes sense when you think about it. 
She was built in Japan in 1998 after all, but eventually, in the final moments of her social link, Igis learns to accept that it's okay for her to have these feelings, despite her initially rigid views on relationships. Furthermore, she seemingly comes to terms with the fact that because she can't die through natural causes, someday Makoto or Katone will no longer be a part of her life. So to keep a part of them with her until the end, whenever it may come, she asks them to literally touch her heart. The Papian heart that gives her emotion is so sensitive that even the slightest touch from their hand is likely to permanently burn some of their DNA into it. With this act, even when they're long gone and memories are all that remain to the rest of the world, I guess will have indelible proof within her of the love they shared with one another. If it sounds a bit weird, well, that's because it is. But at the same time, it's really sweet and carries a level of genuine earnestness with it that fits the atypical couple of Igis and the protagonist to a T. Now, I won't try to argue that Igis's character arc is original in the slightest. Robot meets someone and, through them, finds out what it means to be human. Mix in some wacky social ineptitude, a dash of cheesy romance, and you've got a tale that's been told a thousand times. But something I will argue is, whether it's a common media trope or not, doesn't matter. What really matters is what you do with that trope, and Persona 3 manages to do something quite special with it. Moving on to the last of C's, we have Ken Amada, and on first glance, he seems like nothing more than a precocious little shit. God, fuck you, kid. But out of the entire cast, he's the only one that veers dangerously close to psychopathic, because under the hood, He's angry, calculating, and driven purely by a desire to avenge his mother's death. While it initially seems a bit far-fetched to have such a young kid so dead set on vengeance, the game ultimately ends up selling you on it. Losing his mother right before his eyes at such a young age completely robbed him of his innocence. And with the answer showing that no one believed his story, as well as having the Kurijo group cover it all up by staging a car accident around the scene, it only makes sense for him to become completely blinded by vengeance. He realized the harsh reality very quickly. If he didn't do something himself, his mother's killer would literally never be brought to justice. But just because it's understandable, does that necessarily make it right? Well, that depends on your moral compass, but the game firmly comes down on the side of no. It'll only set you down a very dark path, which is reflected by the fact that Ken became so blinded by anger that he never stopped for one second to consider just how taking another life would permanently affect his. In all adaptations, this motivation and backstory is the exact same, but it's about this point in his narrative where the game and films divert drastically from one another. In the game, Ken knows very early on that Shinjiro was the one responsible for his mother's death, and that opportunity to get close to the killer is what causes him to join C's in the first place. But in the films, he joins completely uninfluenced by his desire for vengeance, which leads to him and Shinji actually spending a fair bit of time together bonding with one another. Through this, Ken's outlook on life ultimately improves substantially as he starts to view Shinjiro as the big brother he never had. And the truth is revealed much later, making it all the more crushing that someone he considered found family is the one he feels the need to enact his vengeance upon. And on the night of October 4th, the anniversary of his mother's death, Ken and Shinjiro meet one-on-one -on -one during the dark hour. When Ken readies his spear with the intent to kill, Shinji tells him that whatever he chooses, he won't fight it. Hell, he admits that he probably deserves what's coming but he assures Ken that no matter how certain he is now that this is the right thing to do, it won't make him happy. It'll just start him down the path of becoming a shell of a person, like it did him. Even though the death of Ken's mother truly was an accident, the guilt that followed Shinjiro since the incident that completely destroyed him is something that he wouldn't wish upon anyone, much less a good kid with his entire life ahead of him. Because conflict needs to happen, Takaya shows up to reinforce that Ken's anger is righteous and there's no reason for him to ever feel regretful for enacting vengeance upon a murderer. But because he can sense the life inside people, he reveals to Ken that no matter what, Shinjiro didn't have much time left to live anyway, which completely breaks Ken's spirit. Even if he were to have his revenge, Shinjiro was a dead man walking anyway, so it would mean nothing. Takaya also notes that the spark of life within Ken is barely there as well, 
which ends up revealing that Ken planned to off himself once he avenged his mother. Holy fuck. Someone get these kids a therapist. Preferably one that isn't Maruki. Due to Ken's wavering determination, Takaya makes it easy on him and shoots Shinjiro himself before targeting Ken. Knowing that he's nothing more than a dead man walking, Shinji takes the bullet to save him and passes away moments later, denying him his revenge, but giving Ken the chance to live that guilt-free life he deserves. In the aftermath, losing the chance to avenge his mother initially makes his pain worse, but he eventually comes to the conclusion that Shinjiro was right. What would killing him really have accomplished? His mother would still be gone, but he would have had to bear the pain of taking the life of another human being. Like Shinjiro, it would have followed him until the day he died. So he vows to live the innocent life that both Shinjiro and his late mother would have wanted for him, and later returns to seas with a spark of life within him reignited. In the end, Ken's arc definitely sticks out compared to the other members of Seas, for better and for worse. It doesn't have the wonderful sappiness of Aegis's, the bittersweet beauty of Junpei and Chidori's, or the grounded realism of Yukari's. Ken's is one of anger and malice, which does kind of throw the narrative's tone for a loop, but in a game so focused on trying to cover the ups and downs of the human condition, it'd be almost disingenuous to not tackle something like this in one form or another. How in our worst moments, we might not just shut down like Yukari or Makoto. Instead, some of us can get so blinded by a desire to enact vengeance that we lose sight of just how dangerous and self-destructive of a path that is to walk. And the final supporting character I want to mention, partially to not end on such a dour note, is one of our otherworldly guides, Elizabeth, an ethereal being that largely resides in a realm between dream and reality, mind and matter. Come on, you can't just say the first half of that quote and not say the second half. Elizabeth serves as Makoto's attendant and Katone's if the player so chooses to just kick poor Theo to the curb like that. Throughout the year, she's a super helpful guide for our protagonists, always being there to help them fuse personas, keep track of the progress they've made with her persona compendium, unless it's Igus, and give them late night phone calls to remind them that a new area of Tartarus is available for exploration. You know, that last part always bothered me. How do the attendants actually call the pro tags? Do they get good cell reception in the velvet room? Do they even know what a phone is? If not, does Igor set it up every time like, okay, you just press these keys and then hit the call button, or can they just will phone calls into existence? Personality-wise, just like Katone, Elizabeth is a textbook disaster buy with a dash of light-hearted gremlin energy sprinkled in for good measure, especially in future titles, where her character is retconned to be significantly more peppy and energetic than her original appearance. One of my favorite examples of her gremlinistic, that's definitely not a word, behavior comes from Volume 1 of the Persona 3 Portable Drama CDs. While she and Theodore are out of the local festival, Elizabeth spots an Okame mask souvenir and coerces Theo into buying it as a gift for their older sister and resident wet blanket, Margaret. Of course, being the little shit that she is, Liz implores Theo to tell her that he got the gift for her because he thought it looked like her. Furthermore, she insists that he do it when she's around so she can see Margaret's reaction firsthand. Due to living outside of our reality, confined to a small room most of the time, she doesn't really know much about our customs, human interaction, or even something simple like our food. This allows for a lot of fish out of water comedy when bringing her requested items from our world or when taking her on tours of certain locations around the city. As she bonds with her guests throughout the year-long journey, she begins to develop romantic feelings for them, regardless of gender. This culminates in her final tour request, the protagonist's bedroom. Regardless of what options are chosen here, she makes the decision to discontinue their excursions around the town. She recognizes that her duties as an attendant are incredibly important, but due to her newfound romantic feelings towards her guest, she feels as though she'd eventually be tempted into giving up those duties to remain by their side in the human world. Which, funny enough, kinda ends up happening in the main canon timeline. During her battle with Makoto and Monad, she laments that she doesn't really understand why she's here or who she is. She hoped that by fighting someone stronger than her, that answer would just be plopped into her lap. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. And she ultimately walks away from their fight, realizing that a reason for being can't be given to her by others. She has to be the one to decide her path. 
After witnessing Makoto's sacrifice to seal away Nyx, and observing Caesar's journey throughout the abyss of time, Elizabeth feels that she now has a purpose. She then leaves the Velvet Room behind to dedicate her life to finding a way to free her guests from the Great Seal. And even if she can't give him another chance at life, she hopes to be able to at least find a way to let his soul finally rest. Despite Margaret and Theodore's insistence to stay over the years, Elizabeth digs her heels in and insists that this is her path now. Her immense dedication to this cause still annoys Margaret, as do most things, but she also recognizes that same dedication will likely bring her back to the Velvet Room one day. Not as an attendant, but as a guest. Even if it's a plot point that isn't touched on very often in the official games, turning Elizabeth into an active character with her own journey and hardships to overcome is what elevates her to being my favorite of the Velvet Room attendants. But on the other hand, setting this walking disaster loose on the world of man completely unsupervised is the most frightening idea this franchise has ever put forward. My reality can become just the way you like. Okay, second most frightening. Through these additional characters, the game's main thesis statement of living your best life with the limited time you have is strengthened substantially. Mitsuru, Aegis, and the start of Elizabeth's journey all share the theme of carving your own path and finding your own answer as to why you're here. Junpei's presents the idea of letting go of the world's expectations for you and just doing the best that you can do. And finally, Yukari, Ken, and Shinjiro's all state that while the past may hurt, holding onto that pain will only grind away at you. As impossible as it may seem, let go of that pain and focus on the future ahead. That last bit will be expanded upon wonderfully in the answer, but we'll get there when we get there. And what really seals the deal here is that elements of all these different arcs apply in some way to the protagonists. As discussed, Makoto's past destroyed him and left him with a general lack of purpose or direction whatsoever. He doesn't really know why he's here, so his entire life is the very definition of treading water. Katone also has a hard time letting go of her past pain as well. She's kind of directionless at the start, and lets others' expectations of her guide her into wearing a mask of happiness, even though she's hurting. However, with both of them managing to conquer those demons in their final months of life, it leads them to their answer to life and the main idea that the entire game has been trying to push since the loading cinematic. You are mortal. You will die. But that certainty is exactly why it's so important to not fall into a nihilistic slump and instead try your absolute hardest to move past these hurdles to come out the other end even stronger. To then use that strength to lift others up and live your best life with those closest to you before it's time to go. I've given tons of time to the heroes of this story, but the villains aren't anything to write off. The story's supernatural entities are a nice subversion of the standard big bad evil wants to wipe out earth cliche that we've seen a million times, because none of them are actively malicious. The human villains, Takaya, Jin, and Iku... <sighs> Ikuts... fuck's sake. <laughs> Hard to say, isn't it? Those three are, though, which is why they're at the bottom of the P3 villain tier list, and I honestly forget about them every time I bring up this game. But Ryoji, Nyx, and even Erebus are literally just doing their jobs. They're only doing what the human race ask them to do. Let's start with my favorite of the bunch, Ryoji Mochizuki, also known as Death, or the Harbinger, or the Appraiser. My man has a lot of titles. A shadow created a decade ago by the zealots within the Kurijo group, he was meant to awaken the hibernating Nyx to help bring the fall of humanity. And he would have succeeded were it not for the quick thinking of Aegis. During their fight on the Moonlight Bridge, she realized he couldn't be killed, so she made the decision to seal him within the body of the only survivor of a nearby car accident. From here, Death loses all memories of his role in the fall and starts his life anew, growing up alongside his host and becoming ever more human throughout the decade. Upon their exposure to the Dark Hour once more, he starts appearing to them as a creepy kid in prison clothing. Later known as Pharos, he gives them cryptic warnings about the trials presented by the Twelve Arcana Shadows, as well as the vague promise of an incoming end-of-the-world event. 
Throughout the year and the subsequent destruction of the Arcana Shadows, Pharos begins to bond more with the protagonist and understand more about humanity, until the destruction of the Twelfth and Final Shadow, where he tells them that his time is up and bids them farewell. Now freed from his prison, Death is reborn in our world as Ryoji Mochizuki, a charming, fun-loving amnesiac with a smile on his face at all times. After briefly meeting the protagonist one night, he immediately transfers to Gekokan High with the intent of becoming friends with them, much to the chagrin of Aegis, who instantly sees him as a threat, but because of her memory being wiped, is unable to rationalize as to why. During his time at Gekokan, he tries his best to become friends with just about everybody he sees, but due to him being a bit socially awkward, he ends up weirding out a lot of his fellow classmates with his overbearing and overly flirtatious personality. He does, however, manage to befriend everyone in sees, barring Aegis, of course, who is constantly standoffish towards him and tries her best to put space between him and the protagonist to protect them. And in the film's case, the latter is done quite literally. Speaking of, the films do even more to strengthen his character. All he wants is for people around him to be happy. So, despite Makoto's insistence to just go away, Ryoji ends up orbiting him constantly, determined to make him smile. After finding himself in debt after accidentally destroying Tanaka's custom-tailored suit, Makoto ends up working odd jobs around the town together with Ryoji. Through their time working together, it slowly starts to seem like Ryoji will be the one that truly gets Makoto to understand why the world around him is such a wonderful place. As for his appearance in Portable, Ryoji's characterization is further explored through his social link with Katone. Here, we see a much more nuanced, caring version of his character that is only briefly touched on in the original game. And towards the end of Katone's social link, he even ends up falling in love with her, stating that he'd love her no matter her gender. And another one for the disaster buy pile. This is an oddly large pile for a game made in Japan in 2010. Good for them! Good for them, but in each adaptation, it eventually all comes crumbling down when he ventures out to the Moonlight Bridge during the Dark Hour. It's here that he's cornered by Aegis, and both of them regain their memories of what he really is. Because no one else is around to stop her, Aegis attempts to kill him in cold blood, but Ryoji effortlessly overpowers her, leaving her on death's doorstep in the game, and technically killing her in the film. But even at this point, with all of his memories restored, he still retains that humanity he gained from living alongside the protagonist and offers them a choice. Fight Nyx and lose, or kill him, and the entire group will instantly lose every memory related to the Dark Hour, which will allow them to live their final few months in peace, completely unaware of the impending fall of humanity. Even though he isn't fully human, he understands just how hard of a decision this is so he gives them until December 31st to make their decision. And just as promised, he appears to the protagonist one final time on the 31st to hear their decision. When they choose to spare his life, he takes the form of death once more to try and coerce them into killing him. But no matter how hard he pleads, their answer stays the same. And it genuinely saddens him. He cares for Makoto and Katone like family and doesn't want to see them spend the little time they have left suffering the existential dread of an unavoidable death. He truly believes that no matter how hard they fight, Nyx cannot be beaten and they'll be throwing away their lives for nothing. But because of that bond they've shared, he ultimately respects their wishes and leaves the group on friendly terms. At least in the games. This choice is what really cements my love for this character. Up until this point, he's a fun, charming little lad, but here we see how he's constantly torn between his two identities and the humanity he's gained makes him truly saddened by what he has to do. This easy way out is the only thing he can offer the friends that have showed him just how wonderful life can be. Even after becoming the appraiser of Nyx, he remarks that even though he was only briefly known as Ryoji, he didn't mind it and laments that if more people had the strength of seas, perhaps the fall could have been avoided entirely. As for Nyx herself, she's an almighty astronomical entity known as a planet eater that crashed into our world millions of years ago. Her psyche remained attached to Earth, whereas her body became our moon. Early humanity sensed her presence and evolved to seal her incompatible psyche within their collective consciousness as shadows. Were the two parts of her to ever reunite, she would destroy the Earth in an event referred to in ancient prophecies as the Fall. Despite her part in this end-of-the-world event, 
Nyx herself remains ambivalent to humanity. What actually alerts her to humanity's desire for the fall is either Ryoji or a being known as Erebus, born from the darkest parts of humanity's psyche. Despite looking far more overtly monstrous than Nyx or her avatar, Erebus isn't actively malicious either. It's simply doing the one thing that it was created to do. Find a way to fulfill the desires that birthed it. Make contact with Nyx to have her bring the fall. In the end, we end up being the architect of our own demise. Now, I usually don't find stories like this, where humanity is the problem, to be all that interesting. Mainly because so many of them devolve into misery porn that just states, people fucking suck and we deserve it. But Persona 3's final moments and future titles in the series, especially Royal's final confrontation with Maruki, instead opt for a more hopeful outlook. Although the loss continued to call for Nyx during Caesar's fight with her avatar, the team stays resolute in their desire to not take the easy way out. No matter what happens, they'll face the hardships of life and grow stronger because of it to lift up those around them that need it. And no resolve among them is stronger than their leaders, who, through their immovable will to keep the world safe, manages to summon the strength to seal Nyx away from the world of man at the cost of their own life. What Persona 3 ends up saying through the final battle with Nyx and Erebus is that our world is undeniably full of misery and those who crumble under adversity, always seeking the path of least resistance. But it's also full of people that will keep getting back up no matter what the world throws at them, determined to bring light to life however they can. And as long as there's people out there fighting for a better future, humanity is worth saving. These villains ultimately exist to remind our heroes, and in turn, the audience, of this invaluable fact of life that is all too often forgotten. With Caesar's victory over Nyx, all returns to normal. Everyone loses their memories of everything related to the Dark Hour and all memories they made during that time period. Everyone but Igis. Because of her mechanical nature, she remembers everything. But since she transferred to GeckoCon during the summer, no one remembers her. She's just another face in the crowd. So she spends the next month completely alone, keeping watch over the protagonist from a distance and hoping that when graduation day comes, they'll remember her and the promise they all made to one another. Despite giving their life to seal away Nyx over a month ago, the protagonist still clings to life for reasons unknown. But as graduation day draws nearer and nearer, their grip on this plane starts to slip, to the point where they collapse in Igis's lap while they wait for the rest of their friends to show up on the roof. In the answer, it's confirmed that their previous promise to meet with their friends on graduation day was actually what kept them going. Only when that promise was fulfilled did they finally accept their fate. They're literally too sentimental to die. Now, in Portable, you can actually choose who stays with the protagonist during their final moments in New Game Plus. But none of them have the emotional gut punch of Igus's route. No, I'm not biased. Why would you even insinuate that? So that's the one I'll be focusing on. And there's two different versions of that ending that I want to talk about. The original and the films. Portable's version is, unfortunately, kind of a flop in my eyes due to the visual novel presentation, robbing it of its perfect pacing and a lot of the little important details. I still headcanon all the strongest parts of the two endings happening in Katone's ending as well, but what's actually there on screen is a bit lacking. In the base game, as Igus admires the view from atop the roof, she thanks Makoto for everything and starts to cry. He uses what little strength he has left to wipe the tears from her eyes and assures her that everything will be okay. They both then hear the voices of their friends as they run up to the roof, but aside from his initial shock at hearing them, Makoto never takes his eyes off of Igis. Even though his friends are very important to him, Igis is the one that truly completes him and he wants nothing more than for her to be the last thing he sees. Something else exclusive to the original version of the ending is that in Makoto's final moments, Igis appears human to him, which is not only a nice throwback to earlier in the game where Professor Edogawa talks about the euphoric, dreamlike feeling that some have as they die, but a testament to what Igis was to Makoto. She may only see herself as a machine, but he saw that her heart was just as human as everyone else around her. It's a beautiful little detail that really cements just how at peace he was in the end. Then there's the film's version. 
Here, he actually turns away from Aegis when he hears the shouts, and manages to catch one last glimpse of his friends. Like in the game, they don't reach him in time, but that's not what matters. What matters is that he sees that they were able to remember the promise they all made, just as he did. With that final bit of confirmation, he's finally at peace, and for the first time in over a decade, truly happy. He found his answer to life, and his sacrifice will protect those he cares for long after he's gone. Now, there's no reason to fight his fate, so he manages to smile at them one final time before passing away peacefully in the lap of the one he loves. Despite their differences in execution, both of these endings serve as a great capper to the journey and what it's been trying to say since the very beginning. From the moment we're born, our journey's end is set in stone, and no matter what, someday everything we've come to know will just end. But that ticking clock is what gives everything we do real meaning. From the more mundane aspects of our lives such as school and work, to the monumentally important like those we grow close to or even fall in love with. This is the answer that both Makoto and Katone found through their respective journeys. It led to Makoto finding true happiness and purpose for the first time in at least a decade, and Katone finally didn't have to put on a mask of joy anymore to distance herself from how she really felt. That mask is just who she naturally became. And these revelations are why even though they can both tell that it's their time to go, they both smile until the very end. Following the success of Persona 3, an enhanced version of the game, Persona 3 Fez, was released a little over one year later in 2007. While the Japanese release only included the new content, the American release included both stories on one disc. There were some mild gameplay improvements, a couple narrative changes, and a new social link so important that I was genuinely shocked when I learned it wasn't in the original release. Aegis, who now represents the Aeon Arcana, but it also had a brand new epilogue attached called The Answer, or Episode Aegis in Japan, or Aegis Favoritism Fanfiction by its harshest critics. Which, I mean shit, they're kinda right. Going into this epilogue, I was genuinely expecting the absolute pits, because I had heard nothing but bad things about it. And to an extent, those musings weren't incorrect. From a gameplay stance, the answer inherits every problem from the journey, but there's so much worse. By forcing the player into playing on hard mode, resetting their level all the way back to 25, and removing the Persona Compendium, the answer is a grindfest in every sense of the word. And if you can't appreciate this expansion's stronger elements because of just how unpleasant it can be to play, I can't say I blame you. However, if you're able to look past the, admittedly, pretty massive gameplay issues, I feel like there's something genuinely special here. Taking place roughly a month after the events of the base game, the answer starts in a surprisingly dark place compared to the bittersweet beauty of the journey's ending. Makoto is dead and buried, and instead of taking the expected, he's gone but we're strong enough to keep going route, the answer opts for a far more realistic approach to death. With him gone, there's this depressive energy that looms over the surviving members of Seas. Everyone lacks the drive they used to, and rarely even gets together to hang out anymore, instead spending their time trying to best cope with the reality of a life without their best friend. Yukari spends all of her time distracted at cram school in a misguided attempt to ignore her pain, and Mitsuru orders the collection of every piece of gear related to Seas so she has an excuse to never get involved in anything like this ever again. But at first glance, the one suffering the most is our new protagonist, Aegis, who has been completely consumed by grief. After Makoto's death, every aspect of her life and all that she had built up over the last few months quickly started to fall apart. She no longer found any joy in discovering the wonders of life and views her entire existence as meaningless since she was unable to fulfill her life's purpose of keeping the one she cared for safe. The agony that resulted from his passing was so great that she was the only one in seas who wasn't able to attend his funeral, being unable to face the reality that 
it was time to say goodbye. Shortly after, she then requested to hold on to his evoker. She claimed that it was for safekeeping, but it's more than likely that she kept it close as a way to keep a small part of him around. Not being able to face him though only exasperated her distress. She began spending more time all alone in her room and eventually decided to completely drop any future schooling. Because she feels that her life has no purpose, all she wants at this point is for Mitsuru to return her to the Kirijo labs so she can live out the rest of her days locked away from the world. In the rare moments where sleep comes to her, she's tormented by the same nightmare in which she sits alone in a pitch black void ruminating on her failure. Eventually, Makoto appears in the distance, but no matter how fast she runs or how loudly she calls out to him, she's never able to catch him. Eventually, the pain becomes too much for her, and in yet another attempt to run from it, she wishes to completely shut herself off from the human side of herself she found over the last year. Unbeknownst to her, this wish inadvertently creates a shadow manifestation of herself, one that makes it their life's mission to track her down, setting the stage for the answer's main conflict. After one such nightmare weeks later, Philemon appears to Aegis in his butterfly form and bestows upon her the same potential of the wildcard Makoto had. Immediately after, Fuka alerts her to an intruder in the dorm, which upon confronting, identifies itself as Metis and claims that she's only here to protect Aegis, but to fully ensure her safety, her friends must die. While Aegis manages to temporarily subdue Metis due to her hesitation in combat, Metis gains the upper hand with her own version of Orgia mode. So with Aegis out of the way, she moves on to the rest of Seas, starting with Ken for maximum audience manipulation. It's only here, when the possibility of losing another friend becomes a very real danger, does she begin to awaken the power passed down to her. And this awakening ends up mirroring Makoto's in many ways. Both awakenings were fueled by the desire to keep an innocent safe from death, and both have a figure present in their subconscious, pushing them forward. In Makoto's, it was Pharos coaxing him into it, but in Aegis's, Makoto appears to her as a silent reminder, not only of what she lost, but the pain it caused her. But through his silent assurance, she realizes something important. She has the power to stop at this time. With this realization, she finds the same strength that Makoto did, the strength to not only survive, but to use that strength to protect those around her. In this moment, her will is truly immovable, and that willpower is what leads to her fully awakening the power of the wild card. Her persona Athena metamorphoses into Orpheus and unleashes a sonic blast that instantly overloads Metis' circuitry, completely disarming her and leaving her in a barely functional state. With this newfound strength, Aegis's arcana is no longer the Aeon, but the Fool an arcana that symbolizes new beginnings with infinite possibilities, as Athena's metamorphosis wonderfully mirrors. And just as Aegis promised to always stay by Makoto's side to protect him, Orpheus being the one to heed her call can be seen as a small part of Makoto always being there to protect her and her friends when she needs it most, showing that the relationship those two shared with one another was and is, even in death, truly special. Nearly two days after their conflict, Aegis finally recovers from her awakening and we're introduced to Metis proper. And judging by that introductory sequence, you'd assume she'd act like a confident stone cold killer, right? Well, she actually ends up being the complete opposite. She's instantly shown to be incredibly insecure and easily flustered when the group begins questioning her. Despite claiming to not have any memories of her past, she does manage to confirm the group's suspicions that time around the dorm isn't flowing as it should. Every time the clock strikes midnight, the day of March 31st repeats, and will continue to repeat until a supernatural phenomenon known as the Abyss of Time is dealt with. When further grilled as to who exactly she is and why she's even here, she reiterates that she's here with the sole intention of keeping her only sister safe, and reassures them that she won't attack them anymore. The sister part of that claim instantly raises red flags, as Mitsuru points out that Aegis didn't have any previous sister models that match Metis, and that Aegis is the last of her kind. 
until Atlas decides to make more of them. Unable to provide a solid retort or really any evidence behind a single one of her claims, Junpei and especially Akihiko both feel it's better if they leave her behind and avoid the risk of being stabbed in the back later. The idea of being left behind instantly sets Metis off and she begins apologizing profusely, taking the entire team by surprise. At this, newly appointed leader Aegis makes a deal with Metis. She can come along with them if she promises to not only fight to protect her, but her friends as well. Metis then accepts with a tone so childishly giddy that it's enough to give you whiplash, and just as they're all about to head back upstairs to recuperate, Metis quietly asks if she can start calling her sister. Could I call you sister? Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you, sister! Going forward, there's a lot of little scenes like this where whenever Metis receives even the slightest bit of positive attention from Igus, her expression and inflections instantly perk up, and it melts my heart every goddamn time. I'll readily admit though, aside from these cute little moments, I didn't like Metis much throughout a good chunk of my first playthrough. She's a really great party member with nigh unparalleled offensive capabilities, but character-wise, Almost every time she interacted with anyone that wasn't Igus, I was just sitting there like, girl, what the hell is your deal? Could you maybe tone it down a couple ticks? About midway through the group's fights in the Colosseum is where it all clicked though. Upon Igus stating that she'll give up her key fragment and possibly her life to stop the group's infighting, Metis completely breaks down. She reveals that when she came into existence a month ago, there were only two things she knew. One, somewhere in the world she had a sister that would understand her, and two, if she didn't take action, that sister would die and she would be all alone once more. Since she initially believed that death would come from the abyss of time, she hastily made the decision to kill those it latched onto. If Seas was dead, the abyss wouldn't have any more despair to feed on, and it would go with them. It's only later that she realizes it was the power of the wild card that would lead to her death the same power her assault on Igus's friends ultimately awakened. So, completely overtaken with guilt for essentially setting her sister on the path to death, she made the decision to protect Igus no matter what, even if she'd ultimately hate her for it. And the final point that really cements your understanding of this character and what really turned me around on her comes in the game's final moments, where it's revealed that Metis is actually a being born from Igus's repressed emotions, a shadow of sorts. It's not the most surprising twist. I mean, for Christ's sake, her persona is literally called Psyche. But with the confirmation that Metis is a manifestation of Igus's more human side that she tried to push away, along with her confessions in the Colosseum, it makes everything about her character click into place, especially on a second playthrough. And no, don't worry, I did not play through the answer twice for this video. I played through it four times. Her flippant attitude towards C's, crippling fear of abandonment, and, of course, her generally childish, naive character makes a lot of sense in retrospect. Certain smaller scenes take on entirely different connotations on a second viewing as well. One of my favorite little examples of this is when the group reaches the bottom of Judeca. Akihiko begins to grill her about her memories and who she really is again. When others begin to join in, she, either willingly or out of reflex, closes her visor so she doesn't have to look them in the eye. Initially, it comes off as her acting like she's too good to waste time talking about it with them, but in reality, she's just doing that thing that kids do when an adult yells at them. You know the thing, when a kid gets in trouble and instinctively looks away from the adult because they're afraid of getting in even more trouble. Yeah, that. Even her design retroactively makes more sense. Her body is intentionally very human-like, sporting a torso chassis that much more closely resembles a human, complete with prominent shoulder blades, collarbone, and a ribcage outline in exactly one shot of a cutscene. She wears a skirt, of sorts, like the rest of the girls in the dorm, and while it's hard to tell without looking at concept art or full body renders, even her feet are more humanoid. Iguses are so far removed from human that they almost look like horse hooves, but Metis's take on the form of someone wearing heels. Furthermore, if you pay attention to her cutscene and overworld animations, you can see that her general body language is much more human too. Metis can be seen constantly darting around the arena if the player idles for too long during a battle, and her idle battle animation conveys a very human-like intensity compared to Igus's fairly robotic animation. 
The visual differences between Aegis and Metis are even further exasperated by Aegis being given military-grade body armor, a protective visor, and a COVID mask early on. Were she to put them all on at once, these additions would end up hiding the few parts of her that can be recognized as vaguely human, making her look more like a heartless robotic killing machine, whereas Metis, being Aegis's rejected human side, reflects that by sporting a much more human-looking body. Even her color scheme reflects her role, a black body, white fingers, dark purple hair, and red eyes, a complete inverse of Aegis's color scheme. But more importantly, her design carries with it a red butterfly motif, an inverse of the blue butterfly motif that's permeated the entire game, including the form that Philemon appeared to Aegis as shortly before she awakened to the wild card. It's not exactly the most subtle thing on the planet, but I really, really love all those little details that go into these character designs. On the topic of character designs, a line of Metis's that really stuck out with me on, I think it was my third playthrough, was her insistence that C's equip Aegis with extra protection while she was passed out. She says it's important to keep her safe, but by the end of the game, we see that it clearly wasn't. Now bear with me for a bit on this, because even I have to admit it's a bit of a reach. Aegis's wish that caused Metis's manifestation in the first place was to discard everything that made her human and return to being a mere machine. As mentioned earlier, the armor added to Aegis conceals her more human qualities, and it's established fairly early on that Metis knows that her sister is in deep pain, but she doesn't understand why exactly she's hurting. So because she's just a naive child, she believes that Aegis's wish to become nothing more than a machine devoid of humanity extends to her physical appearance as well. That is why she insists that this new getup is necessary. Not because it will protect her from physical attack, but because by stripping her of the few qualities that make her look human, it will ultimately help protect her from the pain of being human, and she can return to viewing herself as nothing more than a machine. Like I said, it's a bit of a reach, and it's entirely possible Sobojima just wanted to give Aegis a banger new design for the answer, but I don't know, something about it just feels… right. But of course, since Metis is just a shadow, her presence couldn't last. Once the team uses the reformed key on the dorm's entrance, Aegis and Metis are both summoned to the Velvet Room so they can all say proper goodbyes to one another. It's here that Metis lays everything on the table, and Aegis finally accepts that they're one and the same. Metis then promises Aegis that no matter what, they'll always be together, and disappears, returning to her rightful place in Aegis' heart. But with this act, all that discarded emotion hits her at once. She immediately starts to cry and expresses deep regret for not attending Makoto's funeral to say goodbye when she had the chance. However, she believes that she's finally at peace with losing him. And with that acceptance of that more vulnerable side of herself, it reinforces one of the game's main themes, one that Persona 4 really decided to run with, and that's that it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to feel afraid, or jealous, or angry, and most importantly, as Makoto said to Yukari at Yakushima, it's okay not to know what comes next. Those numerous flaws and insecurities are part of what makes you, you. You can spend your whole life running from them, or you can accept them and use them as a catalyst for self-improvement. While the answer ultimately concludes that accepting your flaws and confronting your pain is the best way to move forward, it also asks, what happens should you choose to run from it? This question comes in the form of a shadow born from the collective despair of seas. Throughout your 328 hour long trek through the abyss of time, you'll catch brief glimpses of the shadowy little critter running throughout the environments. Every time it appears, it's done in a way where its back is to you and you never actually get a super good look at it. This way, you know that something weird is out there goading you into following, but you don't have the surprise of Edgy Makoto entirely spoiled. I say Edgy Makoto and not Edgy Protagonist because, due to the limitations of the PSP, the answer had to be excluded from Persona 3 Portable. So unfortunately, Katone does not get the chance to don blackface like her male counterpart. Whoa. Is that fucking blackface, dude? No, 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 this isn't blackface. I'm an actual demon. Upon finally reaching the depths of the abyss and witnessing a repeat of Aegis's nightmares, the shadow reveals itself to the group, with Metis realizing that it must be the true reason for everything. 
the abyss of time's failure to collapse, and the appearance of shadows within all stems from this one shadow born from the anguish of seas. Throughout their ensuing conflict, literally everything about the shadow is shown to be a reflection of the darkest parts of the group's hearts. It taking the form of Makoto is the most obvious, but the part I find really interesting is that the shadow is also shown to retain his wild card, but it's not used in the way that Seize remembers. They all remember it as a gift that allowed him to adapt to any situation at hand, giving him the strength to protect the ones he cared for no matter the fight. Because the shadow was born purely from the collective distress of the group's desire to give up, it instead flips that power on its head. It's no longer something meant to keep them safe so that they can further experience the joy of life, but rather destroy them so they don't have to experience the pain associated with living. So to reflect this, instead of picking from some of the top tier personas that Makoto would have had by his journey's end because of his bonds with the world around him, it instead calls upon those used by whatever members of Seas are currently in the fight, further reflecting the desires that birthed it the desire to shut oneself down. Curiously, it doesn't actually possess a facsimile of Metis' persona Psyche or Aegis' Orpheus. Instead, it copies Aegis' Athena. At first, these two details may not seem important or may even appear to be oversights, but I think both of these decisions were very purposeful. Due to Metis' arrival coming alongside the expanding abyss, it's fair to assume that the abyss latched onto the dorm long before Aegis awakened Orpheus, so it only makes sense to say the shadow took form before her awakening as well. Now, personas are often referred to as the strength of heart, so when it latched onto Seize's heart, it copied their personas. That led it to copying Athena. As for Metis, we've already discussed that she's a shadow manifestation as well, and completely unrelated to the dorm itself, so there wasn't really anything for it to latch onto. All of these little details do a great job of illustrating a true fight against the darkest parts of oneself. Once the group finally defeats it, the shadow begins to dissipate in a shockingly gruesome fashion. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Right before completely disappearing, it manages to take on the form of the Makoto they all remember for just a second and smile down at them, almost like he's proud of them for being strong enough to face the cruel reality that he's gone from their lives. So before moving on, I have a little headcanon about the use of the track, Unavoidable Battle, and I think its usage really ties everything together perfectly. The reason this song was chosen wasn't just because it's an absolute banger, but to fit one of the larger themes of the answer. You can't and shouldn't run from your pain. Someday, you'll have to face those repressed emotions and regrets. This is literally reflected in Makoto's shadow form, because it was born directly from Seize's feelings of regret and their collective desire to see him again, they can't run from the pain of losing him anymore. They have to stare that reality right in the face and fight it in order to keep going. Hence an unavoidable battle. Another thing to note is that this is the only boss fight in the answer, aside from the initial encounter with Metis, that uses this theme. And that fight can also be viewed as an unavoidable battle with the side of oneself that they wish to reject, since Metis is Igus' rejected half and all that. So the use of the song has to be intentional in these instances, right? I'm a genius. Nah, but for real, I know I'm probably reaching here, but the fact that the narrative is able to get me to think about it in such a way is a sign that it must be doing something right. And who knows, maybe I'm not all that far off. We'll probably never know for sure, but art is about what you get out of it, after all. So, let's talk about the lover in the room, Yukari Takaba. The most infamous part of this entire expansion, and at least 40% of the reason I wanted to make this video in the first place. When we saw her towards the end of the journey, she had started to lighten up a bit and really turned herself around. She went through a lot and came out the other end stronger than ever, but once we arrive at the answer, it's a complete 180. She's very mopey and occasionally quite aggressive, especially towards Igus and Metis. I've seen so many people look at her here, call her a bitch and completely write her off. And they're not wrong to call her that. Hell, I'll go a step further and say that Ikari is, if you'll pardon my French, 
a complete cunt at times. So you're just gonna run away? Again? Just like the day we said our farewells to him, and you were the only one who didn't show up. Who the fuck hurt you? Now, you'll probably raise an eyebrow at this, but stuff like this is why I love her here. With the context of the journey, this change in attitude actually makes her one of the most realistic characters in the franchise, and like so many elements around her, is completely in keeping with the main point of the answer, which is to show that everyone in Seas reacted differently to Makoto's death. Aigis tried to distance herself from her newfound humanity in an attempt to run from her pain. Junpei was broken up, but surprisingly, he was able to keep his head on his shoulders and provide a much needed voice of reason even if he ultimately lacked conviction one way or another. Then, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's Yukari. She didn't run from her pain. She tried to take it head on by insisting that the past is the past, and it consumed her. Even though the game states with the Shadow Makoto encounter that running from your pain is the wrong approach, Yukari's arc proves that taking it head on all by yourself can be just as damaging to one's psyche. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Throughout the group's seemingly unending trek through the abyss of time, she's fairly quiet and reserved, but is easily set off whenever anyone brings up Makoto. Because of this, you get the feeling that something is off, but it's only when Metis offers an alternate use for their keys that Yukari's arc really kicks into high gear. They can either leave through the front door and everything will be fine, just like they all intended, or they can go through Makoto's door in the dorm. Doing that will send them all back in time to just before their fight with Nyx, but unlike when they go back through the door to Polonia Mall for supplies, it will actually send them back there for good. So if they lose this time, it will cause the fall of humanity. Despite the danger to herself, her friends, and the rest of the world, the possibility of being able to save Makoto this time guides her into going against the rest of the group. Of course, we know that saving him is impossible without damning the entire world. No matter how strong Seas was, Nick still couldn't be beaten head to head, so Makoto performing the Great Seal was the only way to stop her advances on our world. But the rest of the cast doesn't know this yet, so to all of them, there technically is a possibility of saving him and defeating Nyx. But despite that possibility, everyone thinks Yukari is crazy and starts calling her out on her selfish, dangerous ideas, which causes her to only lash out with increasing aggression and eventually delude herself into thinking that she's the only moral one amongst them. And once Mitsuru unexpectedly joins her side, it only fuels her anger. Because she has someone in her corner, she doesn't feel the need to hold back her feelings anymore. This is most apparent throughout her fight with Aegis and Metis, where she constantly threatens them, mocks them even in the face of pain, and fights significantly more aggressively than normal. She rarely casts support spells, and instead focuses on hard-hitting wind and pierce attacks, at least in my playthroughs. Changing up her fighting style so dramatically for this fight might seem odd at first, but I feel like it does a solid job of reflecting Yukari's mental state. She's completely unhinged here and finally has the opportunity to let out every negative emotion she kept hidden from the world around her. That is, of course, you don't cheese the entire fight with Thunder Rain and a charged up Metis. Even after losing to Aegis, she still doesn't give up. She further mocks Aegis' lack of conviction and tries to steal the key for herself. But when Metis tells her that no one else can use it now that it's fully formed, Yukari finally breaks. She knows that her chance is gone, so she lays it all out. She acknowledges the promise she made to Makoto while holding his cold hand. She would do everything she could to change the world around her for the better, so that humanity would no longer wish for the fall. But ultimately, she admits that she can't be that person. She cannot handle such pain all by herself, so she lets her jealousy and rage guide her. That selfish desire to see the one she loved so much one last time, trumping any form of reason. I want to see him. I don't care about anything else. I just want to see him again. This is where Mitsuru admits that she never actually supported Yukari's viewpoint, but stood beside her nonetheless because she understands the pain that she's going through. To lose someone so close to you is utter agony. But Mitsuru also assures her that she doesn't have to face it alone just as Yukari made sure that she didn't have to when her father was killed last year. 
At this, Yukari finally realizes that she's not nearly as alone as she thought and completely breaks down. Finally, the entirety of Seas and the audience understands her. Yukari had really grown to fall in love with Makoto throughout the year. He helped her take the steps to put her life back together, mend her relationship with her mother, taught her how to open up to people again, and let her be vulnerable with him. With that in mind, try putting yourself in her shoes for a moment. She loved Makoto with all her heart, so to not only lose that person so instrumental in fixing her life without getting to say goodbye, but for Igus to be the one to hear his last words and inherit his wildcard ability and Orpheus without having the strength to even face him at his funeral, that absolutely shatters her world. She cared so much for him and was so strong, but the weak robot is the one to receive his greatest gift? Did her love mean nothing in the grand scheme? So naturally, she tried putting on that brave face, insisting that the past is the past and she's moved on from it. She tried so hard to lie to herself because she's afraid she'd have to deal with the truth all on her own, that she feels completely lost without him and had begun to harbor immense hate for Igis. Despite all of this, I still agree with those that say that this change in personality completely undid all of her growth in the journey. But is that a bad thing? I think Maruki really put it best in the closing minutes of Royal. No matter how much you try or work for so long, the smallest injustice can wipe it all out, leave you with nothing. Now, of course, none of this justifies how horribly she acted towards everyone, especially Igis, but it helps you understand and empathize with the character's pain. At the end of the day, she's just a kid that can't handle everything that's coming at her and breaks under the pressure. She feels all alone in the world, despite being surrounded by those who care for her. And as a spectator with the gift of hindsight, it's really easy to say, well of course you didn't have to handle this alone. Are you stupid? But again, that's the entire point. You see, the funny thing about pain is that when you're going through so much of it, it's easy for your emotion to get the best of you. You do not think clearly when dealing with something like this. And once her head is finally clear in the game's ending, she even mentions that it was stupid of her to believe that she was alone in this world and to be jealous of Igis. Just because Igis reacted differently to his death doesn't mean that she loved him any less than Yukari did or was in any way unworthy of inheriting his greatest gift. This is a surprisingly realistic take on losing a loved one that despite all that the game does right before this, I genuinely did not expect. I adore Igis and her journey throughout these two stories, but Yukari's just has this raw, uncomfortably real energy to it where the game never tries to justify her actions. Instead, it presents you with someone at their lowest point that is clearly in the wrong and helps you understand what drove them to that point. It makes for such a fascinating character arc and is one of the many reasons I love Yukari so much. With her arc's conclusion, in combination with Igis's, the answer's main thesis statement becomes clear. Death of loved ones is a painful, yet inevitable part of life. It will hurt, and things won't be the same after. But you don't have to do it alone. Look to those you love. While it may seem impossible in the moment, you can get through it with the help of those that care for you. With Seas reunited and the true key reforged, they all agree that it's best to use it on the dorm's entrance and go home. But before that, they figure that since the doors reflect the minds of those who enter, they can use it to see into the final moments of their fight with Nyx and hopefully see what really happened when Makoto ascended beyond their sight. And just as they hoped, it's here that the truth behind his death is finally revealed to them. When he left their sight, he gave all of his life essence to create a seal between the world of man and Nyx. While that explanation is enough to satisfy Seas, Metis interjects that because this other side is her home, she was able to grasp an understanding of Nyx that doesn't quite fit Makoto's sacrifice. Nyx is completely ambivalent to the human race, and as such, she would never attack them of her own accord, so a seal shouldn't have actually been necessary. There must be another reason. And as if on cue, the missing piece of the puzzle is revealed. 
a massive monster born from humanity's collective desire for death. Erebus. Initially, it ignores seas and makes a beeline for the seal in an attempt to reach Nyx, but eventually senses the same wildcard power within Aegis, the power that assisted in the seal's creation in the first place. So it instantly turns its attention to Aegis, determined to utilize her power in hopes of breaking the seal to fulfill its entire purpose for existence, to bring the fall that humanity cries for. While the resulting battle itself is a good bit of fun and has a banger soundtrack, there's a lot I just love about Erebus itself. Not only is its design really goddamn cool on a surface level, but in keeping with Metis and Shadow Makoto, it also reflects what it is and why it came into being. The main body consists of two human-like torsos fused together, one from each sex to represent it being born from humanity itself. And like those that birthed it, its main body is completely hollowed out, mirroring that feeling of emptiness all too common among those that call for death. Or Atlas cut those polygons off the model to save space. Now, Atlas pulls this monster born from the bad side of humanity card almost every game. But what I like about Erebus over, let's say, Yaudabaoth or Emma, is that it doesn't speak. There's no self grandulizing speeches during the fight about a better tomorrow, or how humanity is a species doomed to fail because Erebus doesn't have an ego. Like Nyx and Ryoji, it's not malicious at all. It's simply more simple minded than them. It's literally just a big fuck you demon born to do one specific thing and it'll do whatever it needs to to fulfill its purpose for creation. After finally taking it down, the group comes to peace with the truth. Because of the collective consciousness's desire for death, there really was no other way their fight with Nyx could have gone. She couldn't be beaten head on encounter and the masses wouldn't stop calling for her. So Makoto had to die to keep the world and the ones he cared so deeply for safe forever. But more importantly, they realized that he knew exactly what he was doing, and that indomitable will was what allowed him to cling to the mortal world just long enough to fulfill his promise to them on the rooftop. And with that, they all agree that it's time to move on from this endless cycle and start anew, comfortable in the fact that even though he may be gone from their lives, he still protects them from beyond. And maybe someday, humanity can change for the better and a seal won't even be necessary. And perhaps, as Metis posits in her final moments, they can all help ease Makoto's burden by bringing that light to humanity themselves. The next morning, everything finally returns to normal. Everything except Aegis, who refuses to wake up no matter what. So, after somehow carrying her, which is at least a couple hundred pounds of steel and ammunition mind you, up two flights of stairs, the team sits her down to run some routine diagnostics on her. Fuka quickly finds out that almost every single mechanical piece in her body has been completely fried from a massive surge of energy, likely a result of Aegis' wildcard inheritance. The parts could easily be replaced, but the Aegis they know, the one brimming with human-like emotion, would no longer exist. And right as everyone starts to get all gloomy again, Aegis just casually wakes up. Even though it should be scientifically impossible, it's just as Metis promised. You're truly alive now. It turns out that in keeping with Igor's intentionally mysterious speeches, he wasn't lying when he foretold that completing her journey would cause her life to end. The old life given to her by the Kirijo group was indeed forfeited, as every bit of circuitry in her body was destroyed. But through her renewed strength of heart, a new life was given to her one fueled entirely by the Papian heart that gave her emotions in the first place. And just as her awakening to the wild card mirrored the new beginnings often associated with the Fool Arcana, so too does her second chance at life. Agus then reflects on something else Igor told her at the start, that through completing this journey, she would find her own answer to life, just as Makoto did. She then comes to the same conclusion he did during their fight with Nyx. To live is to experience the joy of falling in love, to experience the sadness of loss, and to be surrounded by people you can call friends. With this revelation, Igus proclaims to her friends, I'm a very lucky person. And man, this is where I really smiled. After all her self-doubt, she finally considers herself a person, and at long last, truly believes what Kamijima and Makoto tried so hard to convince her of. It doesn't matter if her body is synthetic, it's her soul that's important, and that soul is just as human as those around her. It's a genuinely sweet, feel-good wrap-up to Igus's arc. 
This renewed outlook on life gives the rest of the team the strength to rekindle the fire in their hearts, and they all vow to try and put their grief aside and live their best possible lives, not only to help ease Makoto's burden, but their own. And as is shown later on in the arena games, they didn't falter. A lot of the returning characters writing in those games is a bit off base to put it lightly, but they managed to keep their promise in one way or another. Yukari became a model and actress, inspiring children all across the world through the characters that she plays. Junpei became a little league baseball coach that all the kids love being around. Mitsuru took charge of the Kirijo group and helped form the shadow operatives to help keep the world safe from larger shadow threats. Aegis went back to school and eventually, through her shadow ops work, met her older sister Labrys, managing to save her from a life of loneliness with the help of Narukami and Elizabeth. Even Akihiko, who ended up becoming a weird wanderer that literally fights bears with his fists, still seeks to become as strong as humanly possible, not only for his own amusement, but to one day use that strength to protect those around him. And through an easter egg in Persona 5, it's implied he eventually found his true path and became a police officer with the guidance of Officer Kurosawa. Yet despite the progress they've all made in finding their own path and making the world around them a better place, the inner demons they struggled with throughout P3 still follow them. For example, a small part of Aegis is still incredibly insecure about her body. Yukari still questions if she's truly moved on, and Mitsuru worries that she's subconsciously taking advantage of her friends since her busy schedule really only allows for her to see them when she needs something from them. And I really appreciate these little touches because, realistically, you don't just get over these things in 2-3 to three years. They follow you for a long, long time. And this talk of Arena kinda leads into my next point. Despite how well all of this works as a finale to Persona 3, the most interesting parts of the seal, at least in my opinion, aren't actually in this game. Most of it comes from Arena and the question of what comes next. Arena shows us that there's no current way to defeat Erebus for good. It will reform every year within the Sea of Souls with the express purpose of granting the masses desire for death. The only thing keeping it from succeeding is Makoto's seal and the seal's protector, Elizabeth. Upon learning what became of her beloved guest, Elizabeth actually left the Velvet Room and thus her duties as an assistant behind to try and free him from the seal. This led to her wiping the goddamn floor with Erebus multiple times over the years and eventually gaining her own arcana card, the Fool. And upon reuniting with Aegis in the TV world in 2012, Elizabeth mentions that she hopes Aegis will one day join her on her journey, but doesn't mention specifically what her journey is as to not give Aegis false hope. Many have wondered for years how this will wrap up, and even though I'm still fairly new to these games, I'm right there with them. So. Let's indulge in fanfic for a bit. Were Atlas to ever continue this plot thread, I'm of the mind that there's three ways to do it. The first and safest approach would be to say that there's no way to destroy Erebus for good, so Makoto is forced to protect humanity until the end of time. This way, the weight of his sacrifice is left alone and everything stays as it should. But at the same time, you miss out on the chance to do anything new and interesting. The second option, Erebus is defeated within a somewhat timely manner, Think 10 to 20 years after the answer, and Makoto comes back to see his friends again. I'm not a huge fan of this idea personally, but I'm also not going to pretend that there's nothing interesting that could come of it. If Makoto came back and everyone acted like he never left, that would be awful. But if you play it more realistically and more nuanced like the answer, I think you'd have something interesting. Think about it. It's been years since he died. Everyone in Seas went through the grieving process and found the strength to move forward so explore just how exactly the sudden resurrection of a long dead friend would affect them. I guarantee it would not be pretty for some of them, especially Yukari. Then you have the questions of how would Makoto react to losing so much time and waking up in a world that moved forward without him? How would he interact with the older versions of his friends? They've all changed so much, but Makoto hasn't changed at all. So would they even still get along with one another? And most interestingly, how would it all affect Aegis and Yukari? There's things you could do here that are really interesting, even if the core idea is kind of a slap in the face. A true monkey's paw, like most things Atlas does. The third option, the one I genuinely kind of like, is to use this entire seal thing as a bookend for the Persona 3 cast. Here, we would expand on Elizabeth's journey. 
Now, since Igus and Elizabeth aren't human, it's safe to say that they'll both long outlive Seas. So once all the members of Seas have passed away, and Igus has lived her best life with them, I'd love to see Elizabeth come to an Igus that is suffering from loneliness and a lack of purpose, and ask her to join her on her journey, to find a way to defeat Erebus forever, completely nullifying the need for a seal in the first place, and finally letting Makoto's soul find peace. And again, since they're both technically immortal, you could even set their victory over Erebus long after the series' main canon. Hell, set it hundreds of years in the future if you want. This way, it doesn't really have to adhere to the continuity of any games that follow. It could just be this beautiful little self-contained epilogue that doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the world's narrative, while also closing the book on the Persona 3 cast for good. Coming out of the answer, I was more than just surprised by the quality of its character writing, since all I had heard was nothing but bad things, but I feel like its existence adds tremendously to the journey and manages to mold Aegis and Yukari into some of the most realistic characters in the series. It does, unfortunately, have some really bad narrative pacing issues that are mainly the fault of its exceedingly grindy and repetitive gameplay. But setting that aside, there's an intriguingly realistic approach to a hero's sacrifice here, one that shows that it's not as grandiose and beautiful as it may seem, because those that survive the heroes, especially kids this young, aren't just going to move on and call it a day. It's going to be a long, painful journey to accepting a life where someone so special to them just isn't around anymore. It asks us to re-examine that beautiful ending from the journey from a more realistic, depressing point of view. How would a group of teenagers react to suddenly losing someone so important to them? How do you pick up the pieces of a shattered heart and continue on, knowing that one of those pieces will forever be missing? If you had a chance to go back and save someone you love from death, even if there could be cataclysmic consequences, would you do it? And if you did, who would you really be doing it for? Them or yourself? Even though by the end, the game firmly comes down on the side of let the past be and accept reality as it is, no matter how painful it may be, it's still a fascinating idea to mull over, to try and really put yourself in these kids' shoes and really ask yourself, what side would I come down on? That is what I find so special about the answer and Persona 3 in general. Amidst all these fantastical elements like the Velvet Room, a 25th hour just appearing out of nowhere, giant cat dog like monsters, and robots growing hearts, its story is grounded by ideas that almost everyone can relate to. Whether it's rediscovering what it means to truly live, trying to run from the pain of losing someone you love, being surrounded by close friends yet still feeling alone, being deathly afraid of opening yourself up to love, or letting anger and vengeance guide your path. Each main character arc is tethered back to reality by something relatable to the everyman. While this does contribute to a much overtly darker tone than any of the titles that followed, it also never feels like misery porn. You know what I'm talking about. The pieces of media that seem to jerk themselves off over how dark and upsetting they are. What prevents Persona 3 from crossing this line is that not only does it have plenty of lighthearted scenes with its cast, its heavy themes of life and death aren't just there to make the characters suffer under the guise of being deep. They exist to help them grow as people and to try and make very real statements about the human condition. Even if they're not all executed perfectly, ideas and characters like this are why even decades later in some cases, these games are still being discussed by people from all walks of life. Now that's not to discredit the games themselves, they're solid JRPGs on their own. But what gives them that staying power is the fact that all of them, from Persona 1 all the way to 5, each have something real to say that speaks to people. And with that, we've reached our journey's end and found the answer as to why Persona 3 is a series I love so much. Okay, I swear I'm done with the puns now. While I still adore 4 and 5, and can admit that they do some things mainly gameplay, a lot better than 3, Persona 3 holds a special place in my heart. Its characters, its world, and relatable themes of life, death, and loss all stuck with me in a way that the other titles just didn't. Sure, there's arcs in Persona 4 that are really good, and I'd argue that everything with Maruki and Royal is at least on par with most of the journey's strongest arcs. 
but Persona 3 is the very definition of hits different for me. Because as much as I love action, violence, and machismo bullshit, <laughs> cool. The media I really love is the slightly more understated stuff. You know, like character dramas that really get into the hearts of their casts and heartwarming love stories. And Persona 3 has all of this in spades. Well, that's all for today. I'd really love to hear what you all thought about this video. It's a bit outside my norm, so any insight on what you thought was good, what could be improved, etc. would be incredibly helpful for improving future content. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, well, honestly, I don't know if there will be. Look, I'm not gonna bullshit you. As proud as I am of how this video turned out, imperfections and all that I'm certain will become really obvious once I have a little space from this project aside, I usually only leave my comfy little COD Zombies bubble when I find something that, if you'll pardon the pretentious artist in me, really speaks to me in some way. No matter what though, I doubt I'll do another massive retrospective like this anytime soon because, I mean, it was a lot of work, and I needed to just take on some smaller projects for a bit. I wouldn't be opposed to making smaller little video essays on specific elements of a game that stuck with me though. Let's say for example, Labyrinth in Persona 4 Arena. I love this character so goddamn much. I love the parallels between her and Sho's upbringing. I love how her need to be understood causes her to completely disassociate and live a lie. And I just love her stupid accent. Alright! with my sexy accent. Real audio, by the way. But I don't want to necessarily talk about the entirety of Persona 4 Arena just to get to her segment, you know? And for my normal subscribers that made it this long, yes, I do plan to still do COD Zombie stuff in the future. Don't worry, your sweet little head. But regardless, I really hope you all enjoyed and that you have a wonderful day. Take care.